Hello, welcome to A Friend Remembers and episode 2 of the Year of the JRPGs. This week I'm going to be recommending a Japanese role-playing video game that doesn't quite get the attention it deserves. I can only push this JRPG towards you if you're a fan of retro video gaming, particularly the 8-bit video gaming generation. This is a really important game that comes from a franchise that keeps appearing and disappearing. It keeps coming to prominence, doing a little thing and then disappearing again. It's contemporaries. The first important JRPG, Dragon Quest, was released in 1986. The series that supplanted Dragon Quest and did come to Western markets was Final Fantasy. But it's not really until Final Fantasy VII in the late 1990s that the series really became a mega hit internationally. No, if you want to go back to the 8-bit video gaming generation and say what was the JRPG, the Japanese role-playing game that first came and wowed Western audiences and became a mainstream console seller for the system it came out on, it's the Sega self-made role-playing game Fantasy Star. This game came out in Japan two days after Final Fantasy in its home market. It really is a contemporary of the era. And it beat Final Fantasy to come to Western markets. Now the Master System didn't do particularly well in North America, but it did very well in Europe and very well in South America. And Fantasy Star was one of the most important games on the systems because it didn't look like an 8-bit video game. Over the years, the original Dragon Quest and the original Final Fantasy have been upgraded. They've been ported and even when they're trying to say this is the original experience of what was shown in the, in the Nintendo Entertainment System or the Famicom, honestly what they're showing you isn't true to life. Those games on the original consoles were very dark, very dreary, very simple looking. Whereas Fantasy Star did things that no other video game on an 8-bit console could do. This is the game that I would recommend for retro video game collectors and players, not just because it's a fantastic 8-bit entry, because this is the game that brought together the people who would eventually go on to produce Sonic Team. The programming wizardry here, creating three-dimensional dungeons that you can explore and play, was programmed by Yuji Naka, and this is actually the game that made Mark Cerny look at him and say, wow, you are a technical wizard. Honestly, for an 8-bit video game system, this is mind-blowingly revolutionary and the fact that they managed to fit this onto a console cartridge release and you can actually explore these large maze labyrinth fine dungeons forwards backwards left and right it still looks visually interesting and significant today although it has aged very poorly fantasy star was made for a time where consoles only had up down left and right and two buttons it means there's no button shortcuts there's no hotkeys to go from one command to another you've got to wade through the menus art design is fantastic it's given from a first person view so these these beautifully illustrated images and characters pop up on the screen that you fight. The one problem is although there are a large variety of different monsters and attacks and status effects that you can work your way through, there's no strategy here in terms of the type of monsters. There's only ever one picture, one type of monster comes at a time. So when the game opens up and you can now combat two or four different enemies coming at you at once, in effective gameplay terms that just means that the enemy has more hit points and can do more attacks per go. It doesn't actually change strategically what you're doing. But you play as a lot young heroine out on a quest to avenge her brother who's been killed by Lassic's henchmen. You're in a fantastic futuristic science fiction kingdom where the game plays across three different planets in a brand new fantasy solar system but there's a lot of medieval and fairy tale architecture you come across dragons and Medusa and you recruit allies to join your cause it's very simple but again Comparing this to Final Fantasy and other games of the time, technically, it's extremely proficient. It gives you a set player of characters, and although the storylines they go through are simple, you do get player progression. The character Odin, who you are introduced to when he's been turned to stone by Medusa, a large part of the plot is you just travelling around and talking to people to find a mirror shield so that you can turn the tables on Medusa without being turned to stone yourself. For anyone playing this game, its age also shows up in the way that it challenges you. The game wants you to go and talk to people to find out where items are, hints about where you need to go, and things that are hidden in the world. And it's no good looking up a guide. If you don't talk to someone to know that they've buried some hidden treasure that you need beneath a cactus on a certain island on a certain planet, just because you know from a guide or online that that treasure's there, if you go there and search you won't find it. The majority of the game really is a fetch quest where you're talking to people to find out where things are to go and get them and just going straight to their location is no good because unless you've spoken to the specific individual it won't be there. And this can be really frustrating, it means there's a very set order of ways you need to do things as the checklist in terms of unlocking the way through the game is very cumbersome and very complicated but also extremely rewarding once you've got your head in gear and gone through the motions. The storyline is very simple but for the 8th bit generation this is pretty much as good as it gets. 
In gameplay terms, there's a wealth to enjoy here. For people who enjoy dungeon crawling, there's a lot to enjoy in these. Although on the old gameplay systems, you really couldn't complete this without a pen and pencil to draw the maps out yourself because the original game didn't offer any maps. If you're prepared to put the time and invest and work out where you are in the dungeons and where you need to go, there's a lot to be learned from here. But for people with less free time, it really could throw a lot of very difficult stuff at you very quickly. It's particularly unforgiving. If you were going to play Fantasy Star today, I'd highly recommend it, the Sega Ages port. M2 did a wonderful job re-releasing this game on the Nintendo Switch. It's a shame that it's only on the Switch as this port really deserves to be seen on other consoles or computers. It displays a very faithful version of the game on the left hand of the screen and it gives you the option. Now you can turn it off if you want the more traditional experience. It gives you the option of having a map so you don't need to put the hard graft in working out where you are in a dungeon and seeing where you haven't been yet. With that player advantage, this game has become far more accessible and far easier to pick up and I'd heartily recommend anyone with any interest in retro gaming, whether it's from JRPGs, whether it's from interest in Yuji Naka and Sonic Team, whether it's interest in Sega, there's loads of reasons why Fantasy Star shouldn't be forgotten as one of the seminal early Japanese role-playing game experiences. And I'd heartily recommend anyone with any interest in retro gaming in picking it up today.